celebrate Jesus today and lift up his name in worship. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so, so happy that you're with us. Wherever you are, feel free to stand up. Let's get some energy. Let's praise Jesus this morning. Sing this out with us. From beginning to end, you are faithful. From beginning to end, you're unchanging. From beginning to end, you are always good. From beginning to end, you are God. Sing that again. From beginning. From beginning to end.
touch the world But it couldn't fail me And man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Sing it out. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing.
Good morning, City Life. If we haven't met, my name is Pastor Daryl. And I am Pastor Leah. It's so great to see you this morning. Why don't you say hi to somebody and you can have a seat. We are so honored to worship with you on this Easter Sunday when we all just get to recognize and celebrate the resurrection power in our lives. Amen. And I know that uh, so many of you may be joining us here for your first time today. We want to extend a warm welcome to you, City Life family. Let's show some love to our first time guests. That's right. Yeah, see, here at City Life, uh, we believe that, you know, God is everything. 
You know, we love to serve the one, and it's our mission um, to lead the one far from God to pursue a full life in Christ. So greeting you in this way right now today, it means everything to us. That's the reason why we started this church. Absolutely. And we hope that when you came today, you felt like you were coming home in the best sense of the word. And so we are one house here with many rooms. So as you're worshiping with us this morning here in South Philly, there's another location worshiping in Southwest Philly today, doing an egg hunt and Easter services as well as so many of you joining us online around the world even. Thank you so much for being here. And we'd love to follow up with you in your visit. So I'm getting the QR code on the screens or clicking on the link in the video description. That would be amazing. Yes, also for our first time guests, please stop by the welcome desk on your way out. We have a free gift for you that we want you to enjoy. And also we want to invite you in a couple weeks to attend our welcome lunch. So if you're new to City Life, you haven't been to our welcome lunch, you can sign up online or on our app. And also you get a free meal, a free lunch, but we also get to spend some time with you. I hope to see your face in the place there. Absolutely, it's a win all around. And for everyone today, we have one of my very favorite City Life traditions, What's and that? that is free family photos on. on Easter Sunday. And so, I encourage you, if you uh, just make some time at the end of service, head right out these doors, through the lobby to the patio, make a right outside into the Thrive Student Ministry Room. We have a professional photographer there to take your family photos, because you all look fantastic. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they and do. So come you want to remember this for a long time to come. That's awesome. I just want to take a moment to just thank you, City Life, for your radical generosity and giving. It's because of you and your faithful giving that we've been able to host uh, Easter egg hunts throughout our community, but also we get to serve and support over 50 missionaries worldwide wow, awesome. because of your faithfulness and giving. And they're all around the world celebrating Easter today also. So thank you guys for that. Um, if this is your first time here at City Life, please feel no obligation to give at all. But to our City Life family, if you would love to give today, you can give in the boxes in the back, you can give online, you can give in the app. And you still can give in the mail, right? We're still doing that. So praise God. Thank you for that. Now, guys, please turn your attention to the special video we have for you and get ready for an amazing message from Pastor Brad. God bless you guys. Happy Easter. Welcome to City Life today, everybody. Happy Easter. I'm so happy that you're joining us, and I want to welcome everybody who's joining us online as well. My name is Brad. If we haven't met yet, I'm the lead pastor, and I want to kick off the message today with a question. Who is the pushiest salesperson that you've ever met? First moment that comes to mind. Maybe it's a telemarketer that you could not get off the phone, or maybe it was a timeshare presentation. Ever signed up for one of those on vacation innocently to get free tickets to Disney World. And next thing you know, you are trapped and you realized that no, you know, not even Mickey Mouse is worth the torture that I'm experiencing right now in this experience. My mind goes back to uh, 
uh, the first house that I ever bought was a little bungalow. I was a bachelor, single in Michigan, and I bought this little house on Phillips Street, and it was tiny, but, you know, a great little starter house to get started in, in, in life, and I was getting ready to leave the house, actually, and putting on my shoes just to walk out the door, and that's when the doorbell rang, and I went to the door and opened it up, and there was a guy on the porch. He was about my age. He had a big box, and he said, hey, do you have a few minutes? And I said, I'm so sorry, man. I, actually, I don't. I'm literally on my way out the door right now, maybe another time. And uh, he proceeded to say, oh, it's okay. It's not going to take long, just a few minutes. And I said, no, seriously, like, this isn't a good time. I've got to leave. And this went on for a couple minutes, me just begging this guy to leave. And then I couldn't think of anything else. And so I just decided just to try to kind of close the door. I just started closing the door. And that's when he did the unthinkable and shocked me. He stuck his foot in my door. And next thing I know, he had opened up the door and was in my living room unpacking his big box. As I watched in disbelief as he pulled out the most complicated vacuum cleaner that I had ever seen in my life. And next thing I know, he's dumping out dirt. He's making a mess. He's cleaning it up. He's trying to convince me this is this vacuum cleaner is going to change your life. This is the most powerful vacuum cleaner. It's, you're never going to have to buy another vacuum cleaner again. I'm just thinking, dude, I live here by myself. I never vacuum. <laughs> Finally, I couldn't think of anything else. I said to this guy, how much does this vacuum cleaner cost? And after I realized that I was going to have to sell my car in order to buy this vacuum cleaner, I lost it. I'm not proud to tell you. I forgot I was a pastor. I forgot for a few minutes that I was a Christian. But I unloaded on this guy and I said, bro, are you blind? What is going, do you want me to give you a tour of my house? I don't even have any carpet. Like, look around the house. I'm not buying this vacuum cleaner. And I get it that for some of you, uh, Easter in a church, it might feel like that to you, that uh, for you, maybe you're not a religious person or you grew up around church and it just didn't really feel like it was clicking for you. And you're here today because your grandmother said you got to be in the family picture. And it's possible that to you, I feel like, you know, somebody who's just kind of bursting into your life, like a door-to-door -door salesman trying to sell you something that you don't even think you need. And I get it. And listen, I'm not coming to your house later today to stick my foot in the door. But since we're all here together for a few minutes, I do want to ask you to consider contemplating one question with me, and that's this. What if we all need Easter more than we think? There are a lot of stories that are available today that are attempting to explain the human experience. But I think the resurrection of Jesus tells a better story story. And I want to tell you that story. It's a story that begins in a garden. So I want to take you to John's gospel. John was a disciple of Jesus and an eyewitness to everything we're going to read today. And he writes in John 20, beginning in verse 1, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So this initial verse lays out the contours for our story. Uh, it's early Sunday morning, just a few days after Jesus had been crucified on Friday. And Mary comes actually together with some other women. We know that when we cross-reference this to its parallel passage in Luke chapter 24. She comes with these women in order to grieve. And what they find when they get to the tomb is an empty tomb. Now the setting for this story is a garden. I'll actually show you the picture here of the uh, garden tomb. This is in Jerusalem. Hundreds of thousands of people have visited this site to reflect on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We actually don't know for certain that this is where Jesus was buried, but it would have looked like this. It was a garden, a garden tomb. And Mary is there, and they're investigating. And when she sees the empty tomb, this is her response, verse 2. She ran. And found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth 
that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Now, these are some really precious details to us historically as we investigate the resurrection of Jesus. And one of the things as you look at this event historically that has to be explained is the empty tomb. And a lot of skeptics of the resurrection, they have tried to explain away the empty tomb that the body of Jesus was stolen. Somebody took it. Somebody stole it. But it needs to be said that of the groups of people that had the means and the ability to pull that off, none of them had anything to gain by Jesus' body showing up missing. And actually, all of them had everything to lose. Everything to lose. The Jewish leaders, the Roman authorities, all they had to do to put an end to Christianity was to produce Jesus' body. If they would have been able to say, here's his body, the whole thing would have been over before it even started, we would not even be here today. And I love this fascinating detail that Peter, he goes in to look and investigate, and he finds Jesus' grave clothes neatly folded up. Now let me ask you, what thief could you think of that would take the time to fold the clothes before they sneak away with the body? And it's as if Jesus just left this little tidbit for us, for history, to say, there's more to this. He literally just makes his bed before he leaves. And verse 8 says, Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. So this is Peter and John. They go in, they investigate, and they decide to go back home. They're going to regroup. They're going to try to figure out their next steps get their head around what's going on. And so that leaves now Mary there alone. And I want to step into her story today and look at it from her perspective as we continue in verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. So now here is Mary Magdalene, and it's been a very chaotic morning, and she is at the tomb by herself. She's crying. She's weeping. And as we look at her story today, I want to give you three observations about the empty tomb moments of our lives. And the first one, I'll call it this, hollow expectations. Have you ever stood on the beach and felt the water on your toes as you waited for the tide to come in and then watched as it went back out? I think we have these hopes and these expectations for the future and it's as if we're waiting for all of, for the tide to come in. And man, I can't wait for it to get here. Maybe it is a vacation. Maybe it's a promotion. Maybe it's a hot date that you've got coming up. Maybe it's a party or a graduation or a retirement. But we're waiting for these events to take place, for these milestones to arrive. And we think, man, when it finally gets here, everything about my life is going to be so much easier. I'm going to be so much happier. I am finally going to f- feel fulfilled. My mental health finally is going to start improving. And then it comes, and it is so fast. And just as soon as we feel the water touching our toes, we're watching it drift away. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, that you realize, man, the date is over, and she's not the one. The promotion now, it's in the past, and I still feel like something is missing. And those expectations turn up as hollow as that chocolate bunny you're going to eat later today. (laughs) Hollow expectations. And I wonder if that's how Mary felt as she stood here at the tomb weeping. And they ask her a question that I think is really such an important question as we Look at this. Let's continue in verse 12. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, here's the angel's question, why are you crying? The angels asked her because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. What an important question. Mary, why are you crying? This is probably a good time to bring you in on a little bit of Mary's backstory. Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala, which was a small village in Galilee, she's mentioned 12 times in the Gospels. Probably the most salient fact that we know about her life comes from Mark chapter 16, verse 9, where it tells us that Jesus delivered Mary from seven demons. 
So when Mary met Jesus, she was helpless. She was hopeless. Her life was utterly dominated by darkness. She was full of demonic self-hatred. She likely was uh, self-destructive, likely homeless. This was Mary's life. But when Mary met Jesus, Jesus changed her life. Jesus set her free. The demonic self-hatred was replaced with pure and holy love. Jesus so impacted her life now, for the first time in years, she looked at her reflection and recognized someone with value and purpose. And that's the second fact that we know about Mary. After her life was changed by Jesus, she decided to commit her life to Jesus. And Mary became a part of a small group of women who actually followed Jesus. They traveled with Jesus and the disciples. They helped to fund his ministry. A lot of people think that it was just 12 dudes that followed Jesus around everywhere. But if you think about it, common sense will tell you that 12 guys aren't going to travel around taking care of themselves. And all the women said, amen. Amen. And so John chapter 8 tells us that Mary was among this group that she followed Jesus. In other words, Jesus had changed her life. And so Mary decided, I'm going to give him my future. I'm giving Jesus my future. And so uh, this message, this teaching, this movement, this is my future. And Mary began to follow him. And she started to follow him from village to village. She followed him for three years. She followed him and thought she would for the rest of her life until she followed him to a cross. And according to John 19, 25, she was standing at the cross as Jesus died. She saw him beaten. She saw the nails hammered into his body. She watched in horror, helpless, for six hours as he hung on the cross, gasping for air. She helped take his body down. According to Matthew 27, uh, verse 61, Mary was there at the tomb when they put Jesus' body in the tomb and they sealed it with the stone, she saw it all. And I wonder this Easter, have you ever watched a dream die? Maybe it was the dream to be a mom and you prayed and you waited and finally you were celebrating a pregnancy only to lose your child to miscarriage. Or maybe for you, It was the dream of a degree and a career, and so you started school and ended up dropping out halfway through with a ton of debt and nothing tangible to show for it. Or maybe for you, it was a marriage or a ministry or a business or something that started full of hope and promise only to to come to a painful end. Or maybe for you, it was like Mary standing at an actual grave, burying and saying goodbye to somebody that you thought was going to be a big part of your future. Mary, why are you crying? She was crying over what could have been. She was crying over what in her mind should have been. Mary, why are you crying? Her response is telling. Because they've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. You know where disappointment comes from? It comes from our false assumptions about the future. And I think there are two reasons we experience disappointment in life. One is that we don't get what we hope for in life. I had hoped she was going to be the one. I had hoped to uh, be in a house by now. I had hoped to make the team. I had hoped to get a second chance. This is the language of disappointment. I had hoped to have overcome this addiction at this point in my life. But then there's another reason we experience disappointment, and that is when we do get what we want in life, but it turns out to be hollow. You ever felt that? In fact, I wanna just for a minute cross-reference this passage in John 20 with its parallel account in Luke chapter 24, because when Mary and these women, women first showed up at the beginning of the day at the tomb, they met the angels and the angels asked them a really interesting question. Luke 24, verse five. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked the angels, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Great question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for life in a graveyard? For the living among the dead. And that's what we do, isn't it? We look for precious things like 
hope and happiness and significance and intimacy and connection from fragile things like bosses and jobs and spouses and girlfriends and boyfriends and degrees. And we are hoping to find it only to realize that the expectation turns up empty. We're trying to find life in graveyards. And so we finally get what we've been after and it can't live up to the hype. You know, my kids love watching YouTube and they've got their uh, favorite YouTubers. And there's one of them I actually really like this guy's name's Ryan Trahan. And some of you probably, I'm sure a lot of you know Ryan Trahan because my man's got 15 million subscribers on YouTube and about 3 billion views on his YouTube videos. And he's best known probably for traveling across the country on a single penny. This guy is very creative, very fun to watch. And so I was learning a little bit more about his life and I watched an interview that he had with another YouTuber and he talks about meeting his the woman who now is his wife, her name was Haley, and he met her and they ended up getting married about four years ago when he was 21 years old. But he tells the story of meeting her and the impact that she had on his life because Haley, when he met her, was a committed Christian, but Ryan Trahan was a highly cynical atheist. And he just couldn't understand how intelligent people could believe in the historic claims of Christianity. And so he just started grilling his girlfriend Haley, and he was really surprised because her answers made sense and he could understand them. And so uh, he continued to, his heart was just being softened little by little until he was watching fireworks together with Haley on the 4th of July in 2020. And as they were watching the fireworks, at that point in his life, his YouTube channel was blowing up. He had more money than he knew what to do with. His, uh, everything that he thought he wanted, he was getting it, but he stood there and instead of feeling celebration watching the fireworks, he actually started to cry. And Haley asked him, why are you crying? And he realized when she asked him that question, it was because he had was received everything he was going for, yet he didn't feel anything. And this is how he explains the realization that he had in the interview. He said, quote, this was my finish line. All of my identity is in this, and I feel nothing. So he began to go on a spiritual journey. He started to pray and he studied, started to study the life and the teachings of Jesus and ultimately made a decision to follow Jesus. And now he gives Jesus all of the credit, all of the glory for the good vibes and the passion that comes through his work that so many people love, that it comes from Jesus who, who was the source of life for it all. And that's why your hollow expectations are actually a gift because God wants to meet you in your disappointment. The question is, will you recognize him? And that leads to the second movement in this story. I want to call it hidden explanations. God, how did I end up here? God, I thought that this marriage was your will. God, I thought you gave me that job. How do you explain where I'm at now? You see, when our expectations go unmet, the explanations are often hard to come by. And so I want to pick up the story there in verse number 14. It says, she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. When our souls are stung by disappointment, it's very difficult to recognize the activity and the purpose of God in the middle of the unexpected, unchosen, undesired circumstances of our lives. But it could be that in the midst of your greatest appointment, God is actually hidden in plain sight. It could be that the king is hiding out as a baby in a manger. It could be that the creator of the universe is disguised as a humble carpenter. It could be that the Savior is hanging out in leper colonies and at parties with prostitutes and tax collectors because when Jesus meets you at the point of unmet expectation, he's getting ready to shatter your expectations. Verse 15, here's what Jesus asks her. Dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Now, this is hilarious to me 
Jesus at this point, uh, she doesn't recognize him. He seems to have his glorified, resurrected body. She doesn't recognize initially who he is. She makes the best assumption she can based on her surroundings. I'm in a garden. Maybe this is the gardener. But what's so funny to me about it is that Jesus actually has an ancient and rather extensive resume when it comes to gardening. And so I want to take you back in time, 2,000 years from this moment to the first garden that we know of that God planted. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and uh, that produced delicious fruit. And in the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God clears the ground, he plants this garden, he calls it Eden, it is stunning. And he puts Adam and Eve in this garden. And then he puts in the garden the tree of life, the source of life. And he tells them, I want you to experience life. And so you can have any of the trees in this garden, they will give you life. Just don't touch this one tree, it's toxic, it's poisonous. You are not going to find life there. But Adam and Eve make a decision that they are going to do something, and it foreshadowed so many decisions that have come since it and from it, and they decided to try and find the living among the dead. And for the first time, they decided we don't need God to get to where we want to go. In fact, God is actually standing in our way. And so they rebelled against him and in their pride decided we'll find life somewhere else. And it was there in that ancient garden that sin entered the world. And if I could offer a simple definition of sin, here's what I would say. Sin is our attempt to live the life God gave us without God and to get out of life what God promised us without God. It didn't work for Adam. It didn't work for Eve. It hasn't worked for me. It's not going to work for you. There's only one place to find life, and that's from the tree of life and the giver and the source of life himself. But as a result of their sin, Adam and Eve were removed from the garden. And I want you to imagine now the disappointment that they must have felt. Looking back, recognizing we knew what it was like to experience perfect intimacy and relationship with God. And now we've lost it. Adam, why are you crying? Eve, why are you crying? Because sin has taken our garden and we don't know how to find our way back. Fast forward to the night before Mary would weep at the foot of the cross. Jesus walked into another garden, a garden called Gethsemane. And in that garden, Jesus would fight the ultimate bout of disappointment Jesus, who has always been one with the Father, could feel the Father's presence slipping away, and he found himself reeling in confusion about God's plan. Father, if it's possible, there's got to be another way. I have obeyed you. I have loved you. How did I end up here? Why have you forsaken me? I don't understand this. Can I tell you, life is confusing even when you're the Son of God. And we don't always understand why we don't experience what we expect, expect. And not even Jesus got every prayer answered the way he hoped. But in that garden, Jesus reversed the curse of sin. Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, but Jesus redeemed the garden. And because Jesus came and knelt in the garden and bled in the garden and prayed in the garden and surrendered in the garden and obeyed in the garden, he now comes to us as the great gardener. When we are standing in front of empty tombs, nursing empty expectations, he's ready to plant some seeds of hope in the painfully softened soil of our hearts. I've got a little illustration up here, and uh, I'm going to try to show off my gardening skills this Easter. You ready for this? <laughs> I want to give uh, credit to Pastor Levi Lusco for the inspiration behind this illustration. But if I'm going to plant, what I've got here are some tulip bulbs, some tulip seeds. And if I'm going to plant some tulips, tulips are beautiful, spring is coming. The first thing that I'm going to do is get my little gardening equipment 
and you're going to start with some potting soil. You need your base soil, so I'm going to go ahead and put the dirt in the uh, pot, and that's where you're going to start, and then you're going to take your seed, the, tul the tulip bulb, I'm going to plant it in the dirt. Now, from what I understand, it takes tulip bulbs about 16 weeks under the ground, buried in the darkness, hidden under the surface of the earth to develop, to blossom, to bloom. And so I want you to think about this process from the perspective of this cute little seed. Because you've got him in there, and now that he's in there, you're just going to dump on the dirt, and you're going to bury the poor little guy there in the ground. And then I've got over here some fertilizer, which is literally crap. <laughs> I've never said that word before in an Easter sermon, but there's a first for everything. And so now we are going to bury this cute little seed under the dirt, under a big load of crap. And I don't know if you have ever thought about this from the perspective of the seed, if you've ever felt like this little seed. God, seriously, you're just going to leave me here without any sunlight all winter long, buried in darkness, hidden, overwhelmed. God, seriously, how much crap can one heart take? But if you're a seed, there's only one thing you can do at this point in the process, and that is wait. Wait for the season to change. Wait for the rain to come. Wait for the sun to shine. And that may be the most courageous, reproducible thing that Mary does in this story. You almost miss it. It's so simple. But she just shows up. She's there again at the tomb three days after her greatest disappointment, grieving and weeping, yet waiting. And it's there in the hopeful, painful waiting that she discovers what was actually happening buried in the tomb all along. And that leads to the third observation I want to close with this. I'll call it heaven's exclamation. Let's wrap this story up, starting in verse 15. Sir, she said, she thinks he's the gardener. If you've taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. I love how personal and intimate this is. As soon as Jesus calls her by name, she recognizes who he is. And I believe that Jesus this Easter wants to do something so personal in your life. He wants to call you by name. And even though you're hidden, he's saying to you today, you've never been unseen to me. And even though you've been stung with disappointment, he's saying to you today, your future is precious to me. And even though you feel dumped on this Easter, he's saying to you today, nothing is ever wasted by me. And so he's inviting you to trade your empty expectations for the hope of an empty grave. Verse 17, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Jesus says, Mary, you gotta let me go because I'm not done exceeding your expectations. I'm about to surprise you again. You think I did all of this to give you a big brother back? I'm gonna give you a father. And not just my father, but now he's gonna be your father. And it needs to be said, that if you were going to make all of this up, this might be one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection. You don't have Jesus appear for the first time to a woman. Not in this culture. In this culture, a woman's testimony was unreliable. 
not even permitted in court, but Jesus is full of surprises. And he says, Mary, I've got a big job for you. So I want you to go and find the disciples and tell them that I'm alive. Go and tell them that I'm making all things new. Go and tell them that hope survived. Go and tell them that our story isn't over. Go and tell them that sin doesn't get the final word. Go and tell them that death has lost its sting. Go and tell them that we're all just getting started here. Go and tell them that the reason you didn't expect this is because no eye has seen and no ear has heard what your Father has in store for those who love him. So verse 18 says, Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And here is Mary standing in the same garden where she experienced her deepest disappointment, now experiencing her ultimate destiny to become the first evangelist in history to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You remember our little seed? Buried, overwhelmed, hidden. Well, this is what God was working on all along. And I know that some of you are feeling today pretty cynical about hope. Your heart is tired. Your heart's exhausted. (laughs) But I wonder what if today we could go back to that first garden and make a different choice. I'm gonna find life from the source of life himself. I'm gonna stop doing this my own way. I'm gonna stop looking for life in graveyards. I'm gonna stop following my own instincts. I'm going to God. I'm going to Jesus. I'm putting my trust in him. I'm putting my faith in what he has done. I'm going to the tree of life. I'm going to the source of life. I'm going to the giver of life. What new thing could God do in you and through you? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the life that you won for us through your death and resurrection. Help us today to trust you in the garden, to see by faith that you are working in our lives in greater ways than we could imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know what your spiritual background is this Easter or why you're here or if you even thought that you had carpet in your heart at all. Maybe there's a recognition this morning that I need Easter more than I think. And I want to ask you to close your eyes just for one more moment. I want to give you an invitation, an opportunity to make a decision that billions of people around the world have made who today are gathering to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead a decision that can move you in a new direction together in friendship and relationship with God. If you're here today and you know that you've been standing at empty graves, that you have been bypassing the tree of life, that you have been trying to suck out of life without God, what only can be given to you through a relationship with God. I'm here to tell you that the Easter story can be your story. Jesus died, Jesus rose from the dead, not just for the world, but for you. And he's calling you today by name. Will you trust me? Will you put your faith in me? And so I wanna, in a moment, pray a prayer of faith. We're gonna pray a prayer of surrender. But if you're here today and you know that you need to put your faith in Jesus, not about becoming religious or joining a church, but you need to put your faith in Jesus. I wanna give you an opportunity in a moment to pray this prayer with me. And if you wanna indicate today, Brad, that's me. Include me in that prayer. I need Jesus. I need to put my faith in him. Wherever you are right now, watching online, seated here on the main floor in the balcony, right now, would you just lift up your hand? 
eyes are closed, we're not gonna embarrass you, but just as a way of reaching out to God physically, say, Brad, that's me. This Easter, I'm gonna put my faith in Jesus. Just hold it up for a moment, that's incredible. We're gonna pray a prayer right now, all of us together, and I just invite you to pray this together with me. Let's pray it out loud to the Lord. Say, Jesus, I believe that the tomb is empty. You died in my place and you rose from the dead to forgive my sin and to change my life. So I put my faith in you. I ask that you fill me with grace, with power, with your Holy Spirit. I wanna follow you in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's thank Jesus for who he is, for what he's doing. Yeah, it's incredible. And listen, if you raised your hand, if you prayed that prayer with me from your heart, I wanna ask you, and don't miss this step, to just take one more simple step with me, and this is it, just to pull out your phone, that's it. Just to pull out your phone, you can do it right now. And we're gonna put a phone number up on the screen, and I want you just to open your text messaging app and just put in the word life, that's it, and text it to that number. And what you'll get back from our team are some links to some videos that we created to help you begin to take some next steps spiritually, to walk with you, to encourage you so that we can see this new seed break through the soil and begin to grow and begin to bear some fruit in your life. That's what we want. And so I would just love for you to take that simple step. Just text the word life and we'll be in touch with some encouragement, some resources this week. Here's what we're going to do right now. We're just going to respond to the Lord. I wonder how many of you would just say, Brad, this message was for me today. I need some hope. I've experienced some disappointment. We've got one more song that we're gonna sing in just a minute, but first, we're actually gonna, gonna try to transport you back to the garden. And so for the next few moments, I want you just to close your eyes. I want you to reflect. If that had been you in the garden, Jesus is appearing for the first time in history. What's going through your heart? What new hope is bursting forth in you as you recognize he's not dead he's alive so you can just take a minute to reflect let's go back to the garden and then we're going to sing one more song together Here's 
is where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating again. It feels so good to know you are my own. And this is the
can do it. Brings life out of death. We give you glory, Jesus. Help us this week to walk in your resurrection power. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, we got a little gift for everybody today as you leave. These are little planters. And so you can take this with you. As you go today, you'll get one from the service hosts. And here's what I want to encourage you to do later today, maybe early this week. You can open it up and inside you'll find some instructions and then a little packet of basil seeds. And so go ahead, you can plant those basil seeds right in this planter. And as you do that, here's what I want you to think about. I'm gonna plant just a seed of faith what I'm believing Jesus through resurrection power has planned for me in this next season of my life. And as you plant that seed of faith, I want you just to think about the power of Jesus. He's the seed who became the gardener who makes all things new and watch it grow. That's our gift to you. You can take that with you as you go today. Happy Easter. Now may the love of the Father and the grace of Jesus and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Have a great week, everybody.